Is everyone ready? So good morning. Thanks for being here. This is uh, our first live press conference in some time. Uh, I'm Dennis Gerhardstein. I'm the public information officer for the Ramsey County Attorney's Office. And uh, we're going to have a number of speakers today. They will all introduce themselves and hand the ball off to the next person as we go. We'll do Q&A at the end. I'll sort of run that over here on the side. And we're going to start with uh, St. Paul Police Chief Todd Axtell. Good, good morning, everyone. Today is a, is a day uh, of, of sorrow, and it's a day of joy. I think for our entire community and for our family. So every victim, as you know, deserves justice, and every family who has a loved one stolen for them deserves the truth. Today, we're one step closer to getting justice for Heidi and the truth for everyone who loved her, especially her mom and dad, Linda and John, who are with us today. Linda and John, thank you so much for everything you've done. And Peter and Joel, her brothers. Peter and Joel, thank you for being here today. It's been 4,043 days since Heidi was shot and killed in her own home more than 11 years ago. And I can say with absolute certainty that someone in the St. Paul Police Department thought about her her family, and this case each and every day. Heidi was a young woman just beginning her life with so much promise, so much possibility, so much to live for, shot and killed in her own home, a place where she deserved to feel and she deserved to be safe. This is a tragic case that touches us all deeply. That's why we never quit. We never closed it. We never stopped working it looking at evidence, searching for evidence with determination, ultimately to get to the truth. I want to take a moment to recognize all of the investigators who worked tirelessly on this case over the last 11 years. Sergeant Jim Gray, who's not here with us today. Retired Sergeants John Wright and Jane Lawrence, who are not with us today. Sergeant Jake Peterson, who is here. Each, each of them poured their hearts into this case, moving it forward one step at a time one day at a time. Then 18 months ago, Sergeant Nikki Sipes picked it up and re-examined every piece of this case, every word and every fact. Where's Nikki? Nikki, thank you so much. Appreciate your hard work, your exceptional service to us all. And I'm so incredibly proud of our team led by Deputy Chief Don Benner of the Major Crimes Unit, Senior Commander Bryant Gaiden Homicide Unit, they never gave up on this case, and I'm thankful, so thankful for our partners, state, local, and federal. Ramsey County Attorney's Office, led by County Attorney Choi, thank you for your leadership throughout all these years. The FBI, the BCA, Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, led by Superintendent Drew Evans. Specifically, the FBI, they helped us investigate with the investigative strategy, timelines, support from the behavioral, the behavioral analysis unit, and in Quantico, they provide us ballistic testing, 9-11 call support, 3D modeling analysts. And we certainly couldn't have done the case, uh, uh, wrapped it up to this point without this local, state, and federal partnerships that's so critical in these investigations. Together, we've taken another step towards justice and towards the truth. Investigating homicides, as you can imagine, is taxing work. It's hard. It's often frustrating. And it can be painfully slow. And the very special who do this work do it for two reasons. They do it for the victims, and they do it for the family. Today, I couldn't be more proud of our team, and I'm hopeful this provides Heidi's family with some solace. I'd like to ask Senior Commander Brian Gaden to come forward and read a statement from Heidi's parents, Linda and John, who are with us today. Commander. Good morning, everyone. I am. Senior Commander Bryant Gaden with the St. Paul Police Department's Homicide Unit. I'd like to read a statement from the family. We are extremely grateful for all those who have worked so hard and long to get the case to this point, and also for everyone who has prayed 
and stood beside us all these years. We are hopeful that these charges will finally bring out the truth and result in justice. For Heidi, even though we know we can't have her back, we believe Heidi would want us to have the truth. God is honored by the truth. Heidi's life and memory is further honored by the truth from Heidi's family. Thank you. With that, I'll pass it to Ramsey County Attorney John Choi. Thank you, Senior Commander uh, Gaiden. And uh, first of all, I um, want to just say this, is that um, I am, uh, obviously this is a solemn occasion because uh, we're talking about um, Heidi Furcus, who is no longer here with us today. Uh, but as a part of uh, the response and the investigation, I'm really happy to be able to tell you uh, that we have brought forward uh, second degree uh, murder charges against uh, the defendant in this particular case. Um, in order to pull these cold cases together, because this case has been um, in our system for a while, um, it takes a really special dedication on the part of the investigators and collaboration uh, between investigative agencies and with the prosecution office. And I couldn't be more proud of the work that they have done to work together and to really dig deep into this case. Um, I remember uh, meeting John and Linda, the, the parents of Heidi, a while back ago at National Night Out, and I could see the anguish in their face and uh, just the loss that they have suffered. And it's um, a, a moment here today that we can at least bring some modicum of justice by bringing forward these charges. Uh, we obviously have to prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt, uh, but I, uh, I think this is, uh, uh, it's a product of a lot of cooperation and work and collaboration. So I'm just very grateful to the, just the dedication of the FBI, the St. Paul Police Department, and my prosecutors, Andy Johnson and Elizabeth Lahman, uh, who worked tirelessly on this case to never forget and to keep uh, this case moving forward. So I'm gonna ask uh, Elizabeth Lahman to come up here to summarize uh, the facts of this particular, um, uh, what's in the complaint. So come on up, Elizabeth. Yesterday morning, Nicholas Furcus was arrested and charged with second degree intentional murder for the death of Heidi Furcus from April 25th, 2010. Uh, St. Paul police never stopped investigating this case and have continuously with the Ramsey County Attorney's Office worked on it with numerous investigators uh, examining different aspects and following up on different areas of the case. There are cases such as this one which takes time to gather all the information, rebut defendant's statement, and connect all the pieces to be able to bring charges. We want to acknowledge the importance of Heidi Ferkus's family, even in the face of passing years, has maintained steadfast support for the investigation, the police, and our office, and we are grateful for their faith in us. Early Sunday morning, on April 25th, 2010, around 6.30 a.m., Heidi called 911 from her cell phone, stating someone was trying to break into her house. 38 seconds into the call, a noise similar to a gunshot is heard and the call goes dead. There's no significant background noise, no signs of an actual intruder. About a minute, a minute later, Nicholas Fergus, Fergus calls 911 from Heidi's cell phone. Police can be heard arriving to the house they find Heidi on her back with a gunshot wound in the middle of her back. Nicholas Furcus has a through and through gunshot wound to his left thigh and is taken to the hospital and released shortly thereafter. Police observe that nothing appears disturbed in the house and there's no signs of an intruder. After Nicholas Furcus is released from the hospital, he's interviewed immediately by the police at the police station. Nicholas Furcus tells police he heard fiddling with the door around 6.15 a.m. He loaded his shotgun. He woke Heidi up. He directed her to go downstairs and to leave the house and to run to their cars that are in their detached garage. According to Nicholas Furcus, Heidi went down first in the stairs, went past the front door where there is a table around waist high, grabbed her wallet off the table, and he was behind her 
carrying the shotgun in his left hand and a pair of pants in his right. As he went past the front door, the door burst open, according to Nicholas Furcus. And at that point, a man, 6'1 or 6'2, and a black man with a hood around his head, burst in and a struggle ensued. During the struggle, Nicholas Furcus had his finger on the trigger and the shotgun went off and hit Heidi Furcus and she fell down. The struggle continued and the shotgun went off again and Nicholas Furcus was hit. This black man then fled the house. Nicholas Furcus told police their house had been foreclosed. They had not told family or friends and they were going to tell them that day and also planned to pack and move their entire house that day and finish on April 26th, that Monday, at which point the sheriff lockout was happening at noon. The house was foreclosed and had been sold at a sheriff auction on June 4th, 2009, 10 months earlier. Eviction proceedings had been filed in February and an eviction hearing was held on March 8th, 2010, which Nicholas Furcus attended alone. The lockout date was originally set for April 9th, 2010, Nicholas Furcus called the attorneys and stated that his grandmother was in hospice and in imminent death and asked to move it to April 26. There's no evidence that Nicholas Furcus's grandmother were in hospice or that either of them died in 2010. We do not believe that Heidi knew of this foreclosure. There's no mention of it in any text messages, emails between them. She said nothing to any friends and family and in fact, had spoken to friends and colleagues in 2010 about wanting to sell the home, at which point she actually had no ownership in it. The eviction law firm confirmed that they dealt exclusively with Nicholas Fergus. Despite having to be out of the house on Monday, April 26, there is no sign that there had been any packing done and there is no evidence of any housing arrangements where they were gonna stay. Heidi did not request Monday the 26th off of work, but had requested other days off throughout the spring and summer. The day before Heidi was killed, she spent it with friend shopping at the Mall of America and had made plans with friends that Sunday the 25th to attend church and get pedicures. An email from April 23rd, 2010 regarding getting together with friends that weekend, Nicholas wrote that it was okay if they got together on Friday because quote, I'm okay with that, as long as I can have you to myself tomorrow night, end quote. Tomorrow night being Saturday night. And then on Sunday morning at 6.32 a.m., Heidi Furcus is dead. Dead from a single gunshot wound from the shotgun fired by Nicholas Furcus. Like all criminal defendants, Nicholas Furcus is presumed innocent until the state proves him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And this is at the very early stages of the process and the police will continue to follow up on leads. I've been working on this case for over five years and it is thanks to co-counsel Andrew Johnson and the synergy of this team that we believe we have sufficient evidence to not only charge Nicholas Furcus that he planned and murdered Heidi Furcus on April 25th, 2010, beyond a reasonable doubt. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Michael Krause. I'm an assistant special agent in charge at the Minneapolis field office here for the FBI. I'm really happy to be here this morning and saddened at the same time for the reason that we're here. These are extremely challenging and emotional cases. The trauma and the pain that are felt by victims and the families during times where we have the aftermath associated with criminal activity is often amplified when an investigation progresses slowly. The FBI is proud to have been able to partner with the St. Paul Police Department to help provide FBI resources to assist in getting this case to where we are today. The FBI resources brought to bear in this investigation were highly specialized, 
as what were, were spoken about a little bit by Chief Axtell. The nature of which we won't go into, we'll leave that for another day. Today we are pleased that this investigation has reached this milestone and that we have made an arrest. We at the FBI value our exceptional partnerships with law enforcement and are grateful for the leadership of the St. Paul Police Department and the Ramsey County Attorney's Office. In closing, I would just like to say that this case reinforces the fact that the lives of Heidi and victims like her continue to matter and are remembered. It doesn't matter how much time passes in a case like Heidi's, no one in this team or in law enforcement is going to give up trying to bring justice to victims or to hold those responsible accountable for their actions. We will not stop and we will not forget. Thank you. I will now turn it back over to County Attorney Choi for questions. Was there new evidence that allowed you to charge Nicholas Perkins now or did, was it more of a determination of the evidence from 2010 is actually enough to charge him? So I don't want to go into the specifics of the case because it's an ongoing investigation. I should probably take this off, sorry. Uh, but I will tell you that um, the added uh, involvement of the FBI in having a, uh, a top-notch homicide uh, division in the St. Paul Police Department and really and Nikki Sipes, who just had a great determination, uh, and I think she was new to this case. So I think sometimes kind of having that fresh set of eyes and continuing to kind of pursue information. I, there was information that came back to us from the FBI that I think helped us better understand what had happened. Um, and I think a part of that was about the 911 uh, audio call, just enhancing that uh, understanding better, I think, what had happened. So I don't want to go beyond that uh, because I just think this is an ongoing investigation. Also, too, this is a, a pending criminal case now. And so to, for me to go elaborate too much, I think, would be inappropriate. Could you at least give us a timeline of that? Like, did the FBI come in in the last year or so, or, or what are we talking about? Michael, do you want to answer that? I think that's important. Yeah, it, I think it's important to understand that this has been a collaboration that actually existed from the very beginning. The, the FBI was engaged with the St. Paul Police Department at the initiation of this investigation when the incident actually happened, and there was collaboration that had started even then. Uh, as, as County Attorney uh, Choi kind of alluded to, this is like putting together, in some cases, are like putting together a giant puzzle. And sometimes it just takes a lot of time to bring in different pieces and to look at that and to be able to have somebody new try to find the right piece that leads us into gathering the facts that are necessary to give us the ability to do what we're doing here today and to get to this point in the investigation. We then renewed uh, a new partnership with using some uh, additional uh, trained individuals and specialists from our lab division, from Quantico, and from here that we're able to partner again starting in 2020, uh, which then further helped us with the team that St. Paul put together, I think, to put, help put us in this position where we are today. Thank you. Is it fair to say something, I mean, this is 10 years on, something changed that allowed you to move forward? I guess we're trying to figure out how to say what, what led to this now 10 years later. I think, and, and I will defer to County Attorney Choi, but I think it goes back from the FBI's perspective, it's about, again, being able to keep looking at the pieces of that puzzle, and you keep trying to put those pieces together, find out which pieces fit, which pieces don't fit, and sometimes that takes, takes longer depending on how big that puzzle is. Next question. You know, just, just let me just follow up on that, too. You know, this is the fourth, uh, I think, cold case that we've um, solved or at least been able to bring charges forward on. But oftentimes, it's exactly what uh, Michael just said. It's just basically, it's kind of like this puzzle, and it's trying to just keep at it for a long period of time and adding and enhancing uh, the, some of the, the, the work that's already been done. 
And then we get to a point where we believe that we have sufficient evidence to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. But it's really much like some of the other past cases that we've been able to bring forward, where it just, as a matter of time, determination, collaboration, people working together, uh, and ultimately getting the prosecutors comfortable enough that we believe that we have enough evidence. And that's really what it, it, it takes. Yeah. Well, right now, we, the, the, the current charge that we have is second-degree murder. We believe that is the, uh, the, the best charge that we have at this moment in time. But again, this is an ongoing investigation, and I wouldn't preclude anything uh, about anything that might change later on, but it, we're just uh, still we're just starting the process right now. I think the fact that we have Nikki, come on. Nikki, Nikki, come on up. <laughs> Can I just I'm clarify? Sure it's it's yeah. Nikki Sites. Sites. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think the fact that we had a victim that there had never been any justice for and a family that was left behind to wonder what happened and why they have this loss. And that was what spoke to me about the case. In terms of sites, are you in a cold case unit or what is your, your role? I'm a homicide investigator. And so you, you, you have the ability to say, I, I want to take a look at this one here and, and go through it beginning to end or kind of explain how that works? I can speak to that. Yeah, thank yeah. you. <laughs> Again, Senior Commander Gaydon, uh, I supervise the homicide unit. And uh, we do have a cold case unit. They take a look at these cases over time. And then uh, if they're currently working a case, we would reach out to our um, regular homicide investigators to, like we said, put fresh eyes on it. And she happened to take a look at this case. And then some things stuck out to her. She turned over some stones and some pebbles and decided to stay with it. So that's why we're here today, because of her tenacity and, and uh, decision making and excellent investigative intelligence. So we appreciate what she did. Thank you. And I think the senior commander is being too humble there. You know, the St. Paul uh, Homicide uh, Division is, I think, is one of the best in the country. It's, they got a 91% clearance rate. And right now, at this moment in time, we have just an extraordinary amount of homicides that are just pending. There's an extraordinary amount of workload uh, that's on uh, these investigators. And this work was actually done, to be frank with you, kind of a, on top of all of that workload. And so I think it does call into question as well. I want our community to be thinking about this, that uh, there are many, many other families, uh, just like Heidi's family, who are waiting for justice. And so any additional resources, uh, we have this kind of binary conversation going on or this argument or this debate about less policing, no policing, or whatever that might be. Uh, I think we need to stop thinking about those things because it relates to, as we think about investigations, um, the resources really, really matter. So I just wanted to say that. Question to the coordinator. I, that, that's, you're getting really deep into some investigative uh, data, so I don't want to talk about that. So, could, could you specify, though, because this is in the complaint regarding that, that call, does it appear that the cell phone was turned off after Heidi made the call and then turned back on for Nicholas to make the call? Again, I think you're getting really into the complaint speaks for itself. It's all there. so. I well, just, I ask the well, we don't want to, but we don't want to be elaborating on beyond what the complaint is, and we're not supposed to be talking about things outside of that complaint. So, did you have any reaction when you picked him up the other day? I think that's immaterial to uh, the the justice system. At the end of the day, you know, he was arrested. I presume that he's still in custody. Uh, their the bail was at, at, I believe, three million dollars or one million dollars if he agreed to the condition of surrendering his passport. Didn't put up 
a fight or anything or argued, nothing? I think you probably would have heard about it if that happened. Okay, we are going to send out uh, additional, not information, but additional reinforcement of everything you've heard here today. Some of you do have to complain, some of you came in a little bit later. I do have a copy for you to walk away with it right now. Um, and I know that some of the folks up here can stick around for a little bit, but uh, I think we've got sort of the basics here. Uh, thank you all for coming. If you did not get a chance to sign in, and that includes everyone, I'll give you the guys standing back there. We really would appreciate that for contact tracing purposes. So, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Pakai.